Okay, I'm going to just start by saying hi there. This is Leonard Peikoff. That's how I start my radio show. It's shorter than saying all the possible time zones. Uh, I want to finish a discussion of egoism, take up some written questions, hopefully some oral questions, and then devote the last 30 minutes or so to making a start on the topic of justice. Now, picking up where we left off last time, which was a higher, fuller definition of egoism as a result of a number of preliminary inductions, we reached the formulation that egoism is the pursuit, uh, pursuit in action, of course, by your own creative effort of objects chosen by you as necessary to your own life or happiness. Now, to reach this formulation is essential to any uh, validation of egoism, to reach the ideas within this formulation. I say, if we started with, uh, to, with the dictionary definition, each person should hold his own welfare as the supreme end of his actions, and tried to validate that just as a primary by itself, it would be an impossibility. Why should each person hold his own welfare uh, as a supreme end. There'd be no possible way of even considering that. There must be a certain content to egoism in order to validate it. And what we did by our preliminary inductions last week is add to it um, what we mean by your welfare, namely your own life and enjoyment, and that it has to be in values chosen by you and achieved by you, by your action and uh, your effort. Once you add all that in, it's child's play to, um, you know what I need? I'll just move this one right here, uh, to uh, validate it. Now, we got to that point, and I said we had, we've discussed many instances of egoism. I want to turn now, by contrast, to altruism, because... The validation is of one thing in contrast to something else. So we're interested in altruism here not as polemics, but simply as cognitive contrast. So you first of all have to grasp that we are not talking about this type of situation. Uh, the United States should generally concern itself with its own interests, but if there's an unprecedented disaster in Somalia, we should sacrifice for it. Or, American kids should generally choose their own pursuits and careers. They should pursue their own happiness. But it's only right that teenagers give two years of service as governmental social workers to give them some training in uh, sacrifice and service when it's necessary. Now, when you hear something like this, you shouldn't say, okay, the position I'm arguing against or the position I'm analyzing is selfishness is fine except in the case of Somalia. If you're talking about an alternative to egoism, whether it's service to others or service to God, you are obliged epistemologically to drop all qualifications and limitations, such as well, oh, it's only altruism for two years, or only for Somalia, or only in the case of disaster. You have to consider the alternative to egoism as a principle. And you recall our genus was we flushed out unprincipled people as not even being relevant uh, to the discussion and as not being the cognitive contrast, which means you have to reject out of hand the idea of sacrifice as an exception or occasional supplement to a normal way of life, which is its opposite. Now that is how altruism is given whatever plausibility it has in people's minds. Precisely that they are offered unprincipled versions of it with the understanding, well, of course you're going to be egoistic most of the time, but but what you in fact have to do is treat altruism as a principle. In other words, as a fundamental governing all of your choices in this area. Now, something in this present course should have prompted you to right, right away to look at altruism in this way. And that is your commitment to induction. If you're committed to induction, 
it should make you immediately want to apply induction to any positive principle you consider and any negative or antagonistic principle. In other words, if it is convincing to you that we learn egoism as a universal by induction from a flood of concretes, if it's habitual to you to establish universal truths by induction, then the first thought on your mind, if you think of a counter abstraction, should be what is the flood of concretes, actual or projected, that would underlie this as an inductive generalization. In other words, nobody has the right to assert um, a theory of ethics except on an inductive basis any more than you do. There is no such thing as a double standard. You have to induce your principle from a whole range of examples, but he can arbitrarily assert and restrict his however he wants with the onus then on you to refute. That is a complete inv invalid approach. He has to be as universal as yours, and if you re require that of your alternative, which is uh, altruism, then you will find that you, the very same flood of concretes that you use to establish your principle will refute his or will reveal what the opposite would be. You just go over the same concretes from the point of view of sacrifice, whether for others, for God, for nature. And if you do, you will see what? You will see simply by contrast to the conclusion that you reached in each case, how, let's call it altruism for short, because I don't want to each time say whether for others, whether uh, uh, go through the three uh, variants. You will see in each case that it is a triple assault. S now we're talking about any form of the idea. It's better to give than to receive, to sacrifice for others, to place X, whatever it is, as the beneficiary rather than you. Since all the concretes are things that are chosen by you and achieved by your action as necessary to your life or enjoyment of it, then the rejection of egoism is an assault on your choice, it's an assault on your achievement, and it's a, an assault on your life and enjoyment of it. In other words, it's an all-out destruction. Now, if you know enough to know the tie between cognition, knowledge, and your choice and ability to action, act and achieve, then you know that your mind is a function in both choosing and achieving these values. An assault on your choice and your action is an assault also then on the conclusions that led you to that, which is an assault on your mind. It's an assault on everything, uh, your mind, your effort, your creative action. In effect, altruism says you shouldn't get the consequences of your choices, the results of your actions. You shouldn't enjoy or even perhaps not only enjoy your life, even perhaps keep it. So we could summarize it like this. You, in effect, created the values that we're talking about in three different ways. Your choice made it possible for them to be values. Your action brought them into existence. Your life and happiness made it necessary for you to choose an act. All of that is inherent in the pattern of establishing what it was to value and to, uh, uh, to, to pursue a value. Who else or what else then in that context can possibly uh, put forth any claim to put their nose in the tent here? There's, there's no way, whatever. And all you can do then to, to, uh, to, is, is concretize this by choosing some of the same concretes and concretizing that that's really what the doctrine is saying. And then you just make a negative induction, a universal induction. You see, in concrete terms, what I've been saying. I'm going to just take a couple of examples because the literature is full of this. But just to give you the pattern as it applies here. So let's just take food. I chose certain things as being of value in terms of food. 
Well, right away then, altruism has to be an assault on your choice. Where would we see that? Well, for instance, if the government declares you must eat soybeans because that's been declared a value, you can't have cigarettes, we prohibit this, we demand this, it's a, a, a negation of your choice. Uh, you have to act to achieve uh, food. Well, what does altruism say? Does that entitle you to it? Absolutely not. Well, is that fair that you have to act to, it, to get it and then it's taken away from you? We say it's your duty to give it away. There's no question of justice here. We have something more important than justice, more important than you, you know, benefiting from the results of your uh, own work. Well, then what about on the issue of your life or happiness? Should you starve? Well, as Ayn Rand points out, every mouthful that you take is needed more desperately by other people around the world. Or do you permit yourself to take food as medicine, like the saints, just enough, or like John Stuart Mill, just enough to keep your strength up to serve others? Obviously, you either die outright and just hand away your food, or at least you cut out a, a major source of pleasure in your life. And remember, you can't do it. You can't do it in the name of some value which is going to enhance your life or your enjoyment. Uh, an altruist cannot, by definition, offer you a value in payment for doing what he tells you. Like, give up all of your food uh, because it will, for instance, the Christian said, you'll have eternity of, heaven, of happiness in heaven. And as Kant correctly points out, that makes it selfish. That makes it egoistic. You're just changing the value or the location of the value. If you want to be truly unselfish, as Kant pointed out, you've got to do it without any reward. That means without any value being involved. So you have to give up your values without it being in the name of anything that you value. And of course, the, the concrete instance of this is you, you have to do it not because you gain from it, but because some authority says so. You're simply ordered to do it whether by the categorical uh, imperative or, or uh, the divine uh, authority or uh, some professor's moral so-called intuition. Now, what you have to do is go through every value that we had in our original list and show, like friends, for instance. You chose them, altruism says, love all equally. Your choice is out. You have no, you, you're not allowed to make choices in this uh, regard. Just as with food, etc. Uh, you had to earn uh, the pleasure of the friendship by identifying and establishing a relation and so on. And altruism says it's got to be causeless. Friendship is not something you earn. You've got to love everybody uh, equally. You are loving these friends because they're, they're uh, adding to your life, enhancing it, and therefore altruism says you should love your enemies. Bless those who despitefully use and persecute you. It's a, you see what I'm saying? I mean, this is, it's obvious to you, or it should be obvious to you, that the essence of altruism is to say value something and then throw it away. It wouldn't be of value to anybody else if it isn't of value. So there would be nothing, it wouldn't profit any beneficiary. So you're supposed to choose it, create it. There's a reason for it to be of value and then annihilate it, get rid of it, abandon it. Uh, that is in the nature of the, uh, uh, of the system of altruism, the nature of the principle. So you really could sum up and we don't even know yet about life being the standard and all the higher ages. What we can say at this point is egoism is an affirmation of all of the conditions of value and therefore of values as such. Altruism is a negation of all of the conditions of valuing while demanding that you uh, pursue values. Now that's a preliminary induction a preliminary validation. 
the final definitive validation of egoism will come years from now when we reach life as the standard and then show that life necessitates egoism because life requires a specific course of action and any other course will destroy it, etc. That, that, that's the proper nature of a living being. We haven't come to that yet, but we, you see we're approaching it on a more preliminary way by saying every time we think of a value, every single thing that led to that value, that defined it, that chose it, that achieved it, altruism wants to annihilate and at the same time they want to appropriate the value. So it's a direct, it's a negation of everything and a contradiction at the same time. And therefore, it's a completely invalid doctrine on its face and egoism is, is an inherently unavoidable once you say value. And this is really the whole long thing comes down to you can't say I love you until I say I, which which was Howard Rourke's statement. But of course, Ayn Rand knew all that when he said that. But we we on lower plateaus here have to work it out. Now, there is a further requirement here that we want to look at, and that is, it's always important if you can to supplement and confirm your observations by going to a world scale and trying to observe the working out of the of the contrasting principles in history as far as you know it. And the question you should ask in uh, today's context is, what kind of value or person wins or flourishes under the egoist principle, looking historically, and who loses, or what happens, what is, what is set back under the uh, uh, egoist principle, and the same for altruism. This is on the premise of history as the grand workshop of philosophy. And you'll see whether the sweep of the past centuries confirms your view that all good things flow from egoism and that altruism is a total negation. And of course, to here, the two most obvious civilizations to look at, and basically the only two egoistic civilizations that we have historical knowledge of, is ancient Greece and America. That's basically all that we have in terms of whole flourishing civilizations avowedly based on egoism. Now, the Greeks, it was implicit, but it was because uh, they hadn't yet reached the idea of sacrifice to even contrast it to. But uh, they all took it for granted, including Plato, that you have to justify any course of action by its results on you. And Christians are constantly attacking ancient Greece on the grounds that it was an utterly selfish society, which is true. America, of course, it was explicit, the pursuit of happiness, even though not you know, com uh, consistent. Now, I don't have to tell you all of the pro-life results of the flourishing civilization and the prosperity and the achievement, etc., that characterize those two civilizations, and that in those eras, all of the things that we were ascribing to uh, a, an egoist individually was true of the nations or the civilization as a whole, for instance, they were not, the Greece and Ameri early America were in the in the Enlightenment. Neither were periods where they had authorities prescribing values. They were both highly secular periods, where individuals chose their own values, and in America particularly, the onus was on you to be a self-made person to achieve it and to achieve it in, as a means to your own to the pursuit of your own happiness. These other elements were, were more implicit in, Greek, in Greece, but they were there too. Now contrast this to those periods. Which would you name? I, I think there's uh, three or four obvious ones which I would name as self-sacrifice. Egypt and the medievals are arch examples of the uh, self-sacrifice to God. The communists and the Nazis you can't beat for self-sacrifice to the to the to others to the collective, and the ecologists are the perfect examples of the self-sacrifice in regard to to nature as the uh, beneficiary. And you know, in all those civilizations, 
In one way or another, choice is prohibited. Uh, you're decreed by authority what to do, whether it's, whether it's religious authority or a social authority or governmental authority. Your action it does not entitle you uh, to, the, to keep the consequences, and the result is people tend to, to not act, not achieve, to be paralyzed. Uh, those who achieve are penalized for what they do, and uh, the result is, of course, poverty, centuries of uh, decay, and as far as ecology, and you can read from you know, some current polemics, they say what they're after. So uh, they know it and there's no questions about it. Now that's an incredibly quick cursory run, run through history. Now I want to cover one more topic before we leave egoism, but you can prepare any questions you have on this now. And that is the topic of integration. We have now got... Um, Three, three principles that we've validated by induction, or at least we've indicated the pattern of how to do it. Cause and effect, a man's means of survival is reason, and egoism is uh, the definition of the proper beneficiary. Can we connect these three principles together in some way? We do not, knowledge is integration. We, we cannot end up with a sea of principles which, like the objectivist equivalent of the Ten Commandments, you know, or the 500 Truths. Uh, it's got to all become a unity. Now, that doesn't mean that right at this stage we can see that everything entails everything, but we should be able to make connections and with each new principle. The last mental step should be, and how does it connect separately to the key other things I know. Now, let's take reason as uh, 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 man's means of survival and egoism. How can we put this together? Well, we know, let's say like this, we, we know that egoism, we've just established, is an essential for life and the enjoyment of life, or a prosperous, successful life. We know that by observation around us and by historical observation. And we know that reason is necessary for survival because it makes possible production, which is essential to survival. We saw that, when it was that last time or the time before. And we know that creative effort and work is essential to egoism. Because one of the requirements was that a value uh, is that which you act to, to achieve. Well, if you put all that together, what can you say? Well, you can say, look, a certain method of functioning seems to be necessary uh, for survival. Effort and work is required in uh, regard to egoism effort and work is required in regard to production. Both egoism and production are seem to be crucial to our life and happiness, and both seem to involve the role of reason. Egoism uh, involves the thought uh, to guide the choice and achieve the, uh, the values, and production, we went through in detail how that involves thought. So maybe we've got a direction now here that survival requires more than production. It also requires a certain governing motive, a certain definition of the beneficiary. Maybe survival has all kinds of requirements that fit together. We've just picked two cases at random, and both times we came out with something as necessary or crucial to life. And that thing happens to involve the mind. Uh, we have as, our, as one of our preliminary statements, reason is essential to human nature. And now reason, uh, as against the animals, and now reason is uh, essential in your motivation, uh, governing, you know, that you're the beneficiary. So wherever we look, there's life 
and reason and action. There are certain broad principles that are coming up time after time. So it's not as though it's, you know, you should respect your father and don't commit murder and go to synagogue every Thursday. It's not just an isolated collection. Now let's just indicate in pattern cause and effect. Is there any tie into cause and effect among any of these? Well, as soon as we say reason is man's means of survival, you're right away saying what? Reason is a cause and the effect is survival. How about if we say thinking is necessary to achieve your own welfare? Well, then we're talking about a cause and effect. How about egoism as a requirement of survival? Well, that's a necessary condition, a cause, which with others leads to a certain effect. If there were no cause and effect, no course of behavior would be required to achieve life or happiness or values because there would be no causes. So the whole of our discussion rests on cause and effect. Now, that's just the beginning. What you should ideally be able to do with each principle is tie it in separately to every other principle on some level. And from now on, each time we get a principle, at the end of the induction, we're going to go back and say, now, how does it relate to causality? And how does it relate to reason? And how does it relate to egoism? And how does it relate to justice, etc.? And uh, at the end, it should be the case that they're so interconnected that any one in your mind pulls all the others up. And if once you organize that, that's called having a philosophy. But of course, three principles is not enough, but it should be enough to give you just an idea of the pattern. There, that's what I had to say on egoism. Now, I want to take some um, uh, written questions that have been coming in. I haven't been getting a great many email questions, but I got some. And uh, I want to answer uh, the ones I think are of general interest. The ones on physics, etc., I just I can't possibly answer. So you have to try to keep the questions some in some way related to this course and not just induction in general. So here's a, a written question. Adults must, I'm condensing it a bit, but this is the idea. Adults have to use the knowledge and ideas, good or bad, which we have gathered. Therefore, as someone with a modern upbringing, first forced to work deductively, learning objectivist principles as a basis for the future, and then working inductively to validate them or root out errors. That seems to be the case because um, we're working here with objectivist principles which we learned deductively. Well, I hope you didn't learn it deductively. This person is, I'm trying to not give the identity, but let's say Mr. X, uh, as, assuming that you have to be a rationalist because you can't bring in reality uh, until you already have the objectivist uh, system and then you try to reconstruct it. That is not true. You always have reality available to you. And no matter how modern your upbringing, because it is impossible for an error to be non-contradictory. However bad the ideas you're given, reality continuously peppers you with instances refuting them. And you know that if you were completely consistent with any error, uh, you would commit suicide. You would kill yourself. Uh, so... There always is the evidence available to you. For instance, you're taught that socialism is fabulous. Well, if you get to objectivism, it doesn't mean, well, you just accept rationalistically in theory because so-and-so, therefore capitalism must be valid, and then you can now work uh, to understand it inductively. You have the observation of America uh, versus Russia or East Berlin versus West Berlin, etc., to say before you know anything about objectivism, there must be something wrong here because it's direct contradiction of what I observe. Um, and that's true of every principle. Nor, by the way, could you learn objectivism even in this preliminary way that you're hypothesizing 
purely by uh, deduction. Opar is not deduction. It's a it's a, a presentation of the total, but in each case, I try to indicate some of the kind of examples from which uh, the principle would come. So uh, I would say, ultimately, if you're full of mistakes and you are not a genius, then you are dependent on somebody else to give you a philosophy, and then you reconstruct it the way we're doing. You know, but that doesn't mean you have to be a rationalist. It means you have to be guided and led, but that person has to give you enough data to, to have confidence even provisionally in what they're saying, and then you have to go through the process of validation and make it your own. So it, the fact that you're brought up with bad ideas does not validate being a rationalist because you've been cut off from reality. Now here's another written question. It amounts to why use a dictionary because isn't the dictionary the use of someone else's deductive description? No. The dictionary is not supposed to reach its, its descriptions by deduction. It's supposed to be just a description of the way people actually use a certain concept. And concepts are not reached by deduction. Uh, so this person says, why say, uh, why use words such as inference? Why not just say, reason is thinking? Well, whatever you say, you're going to have to define it in some terms. Where did you get reason is thinking? You object to saying reason is inference. That's too, too deductive. Well, why, where'd you, why is reason is thinking any better? And where did you get that from? And what is thinking? You got to start somewhere. And if a, a definition seems to be inoffensive and clarifying in a preliminary way, it helps to differentiate the concept in question from other things with which we would confuse it. It helps to have, make something stand out without importing a whole bunch of controversial stuff at the outset then I say there's no rationalism and no deduction. So these are two questions that try to deduce the necessity of rationalism uh, or, or uh, of deduction, uh, and I say that neither are valid. Now, I hasten to add that a dictionary uh, is not any dictionary 100% reliable. We're, I'm having a private seminar with a very few people right now in preparation for um, uh, the uh, course next year. And the topic we were doing just recently was on certainty. We were applying induction to certainty. And I took certainty out of the, def out of the dictionary. And then there was a huge argument arose as to whether this definition was legitimate or was... Uh, 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 improper, and I was finally pushed into the corner that I have to think about it. So I'm not sure whether I could use that definition anymore. So I'm not holding out that, you know, just get a good dictionary and start automatically. I'm saying in many cases, it's commonsensical, it's clarifying, it doesn't start with a whole bunch of complicated advanced theories. It gives you a simple common sense view of a, to of a concept. And that, uh, that is a perfectly good way to do it, if and when it does it. Now, here's a question. Uh, let me try to see how I can condense it. Um, oh, yes. Why, it, it comes to, why do you constantly lead us to our conclusions? Why do you say, for instance, let's prove that man's basic means of survival is reason? Why sh what, shouldn't the question if we're true inducers be, well, what is man's basic means of survival? And likewise, is egoism our first uh, uh, overtly ethical reason of survival? Shouldn't the question be, what is our first uh, basis of survival, etc.? Well, if you're really asking it from scratch, why would you say, what is man's basic means of survival? How do you know he has a means of survival? So I wouldn't be able to start there. I'd have to start by saying, well, uh, 
is there such a thing as a living being? And why would I start there? I don't know yet that there are objects. So you, what you're basically telling me is you want to regress back to the stage of being a baby and build up all your knowledge without any preconceptions, exactly as Ayn Rand did. And that's fine if you can do it. But what I'm saying, this course is for someone who couldn't do it on their own from reality, but can reconstruct what she did. And the reconstruction inherently starts with the adult knowledge and then say, and now what did you need for that and for that and for that and work your way back? If you want unprocessed, pure contact with reality with no advanced knowledge of where you're going, that's where a child starts. You then want to live your whole life, but then you can't come to a teacher and say, you know, point me in the direction of objectivism, but don't tell me any of its conclusions. I mean, that's a self-contradiction. You have to go off to an island Forget everything you ever read somehow, have that part of your brain excised and then start inducing. And maybe, you know, in 30 or 40 years, you'll come up with it. I don't mean to be sarcastic, but I, I, the nature of reconstruction is entirely different from the nature of original discovery. Original discovery, I would never undertake to teach anybody because I don't know how to do it. If I did, I would be, you know, an epical genius, and I wouldn't spend my time teaching somebody else's ideas. I'd go out, and I don't know what I would do. All right. Here's a completely different question. Given what you said on the Crow epistemology and its relation to rationalism, in other words, that if you remember from Lecture 1 that it, uh, rationalism was a way of dealing with undigestible amounts of data, to what extent does this let Kant off the hook? And the answer is zero. That was an explanation, a generous explanation I offered that was applicable to good rationalists. That is to say, honest people who truly didn't know what to do to cope with all the undigestible data. So they went, their, 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 their concepts had to float. But if in that process, an honest person discovers that he is led to write a large book which says that the mind is invalid because it's a form of awareness, and that reality doesn't exist because we perceive it, and that that leads to another book saying that if you want something, you have no business to it, that an honest person should have quit a long time before that. There's a big difference between a confused rationalist and a principled nihilist. Uh, they might both be rationalists, but uh, one explanation does not let the other one off the hook at all. Now, in a moment, I want to turn, uh, we have uh, 15 minutes or so for uh, questions, if you have any questions. Uh, but I will give you one more, uh, which I can answer very briefly. Please induce the principle that all knowledge is conceptual. Did you get that one? Please induce the principle that all knowledge is conceptual. I can't, because it isn't. Now think of this statement. If you're talking about inducing a principle, you have to apply and check it across the whole range of what's applicable to it. If you said all knowledge is conceptual, the first thing that it would eliminate then is animals know nothing, children know nothing, young children, where then do concepts come from? So it's obvious that knowledge is much broader than perceptual, and in fact knowledge is in three forms, sensory, and then perceptual, which is an integration of sensations, and then conceptual, uh, which is an integration of perceptions. So perhaps you meant all post-perceptual knowledge is conceptual. But there's only two things I could say about that. If you want to induce that, just look around. Wherever, past, present, here, there, male, female, you find anybody that doesn't have percepts, they have concepts. Now, I don't know anything about Martians. 
uh, if there's another form of cognition that is not an integration of percepts, I'm not prepared to discuss it, affirm it, hypothesize it, it's out, inadmissible to discussion because it's beyond cognition. So within my context of knowledge, anything after perception is only an integration of percepts, and that's concepts. There's nothing else you can say uh, if that's even the question. But uh, so this is either wrong or you're asking me to make a statement that goes beyond what I can induce to every form of consciousness in the universe. Uh, I'm not prepared to say that. I, I'll, I'll even go farther. I don't know whether the issue of measurement omission, uh, which is uh, how we form concepts, is inherent in every form of consciousness whether the unit method is, I mean, every form of advanced consciousness, I have no idea. Just as I have no idea whether every form of matter in the universe is the same as the tables and chairs and rocks and so on that we see around us. I do have no opinions on matter and antimatter and black holes and white holes and all the rest of it. You can only go on the context of what you know, but if you do that, it will not be refuted by what you know in the future. Michael, wherever you are, what's your question? My question is, I'm in Los Angeles. My question is the subordination of the environment to egoism and how it might be distorted if, in fact, by saving the environment, you might save the long-term viability of man. Well... Uh, the ecological viewpoint is sometimes presented as a means to human survival. That we are destroying the planet and thereby going to destroy ourselves in the process. And that is a, is a, is a tame and, in my opinion, a cover-up of the essence of the movement. But just, just to get, get the philosophic point, if it were true that the Ecologists were arguing certain conditions are necessary to sustain the environment and thereby to sustain your life. It would certainly be then to our selfish interest to f achieve those conditions just as it would be not to poison food, etc. And then there would be no grounds whatever to say that uh, ecology is a form of self-sacrifice. So it redounds to the question, what is the environmentalist case actually? And obviously I can't go into the, the, the concretes of it now, but I simply say that I don't, don't believe that any of the claims of the environment, environmentalists to identifying threats to human life are valid. Not one of them, whether holes in the ozone or pollution or uh, global warming or whatever. Every one of those are either distortions or outright lies. They do not redound to the well-being of human beings. The solution to all of those that are offered by the environmentalists is the reduction in the human uh, standards of, of life and or in the more honest ones, the open claim that they want to go back to the Pleistocene, they want to abolish civilization, and that Nature is an intrinsic value to which man should be sacrificed. And many environmentalists have come out openly and said words to the effect of, I don't care how many human beings are sacrificed to have pristine rivers, uh, etc. So uh, it's a question of whether you take their propaganda, their cover-up, because it's just a cover-up. It's like Christians basically saying, we're really for your happiness. For your eternal happiness, we just want you to sacrifice everything here and now, but in the next life. And equivalently, the communists saying, we're for human welfare, but for your great-grandchildren. And the ecologists are saying, we're for human welfare after we've sacrificed the whole human species to purify the planet. Uh, now, the environmentalists are more dishonest, though, because they are claiming there are these imminent threats, which they're making up out of whole cloth. But uh, 
to put it in in general terms, every altruist movement, with the I guess with the exception of Kant, who is pure, um, covers up its rejection of egoism by holding out some ulterior bait to get you to go for it. I don't know anybody as brazen as Kant, uh, which, you know, redounds to his credit because he's, he's honest to that extent. He's a killer as an end in itself who says, this is not going to make you happy. It's disgusting to talk about making you happy, either here or in the next life or whether you're great grandkids or the whole species. Do it, and if it makes you miserable, so much the better. Uh, that's why he's as influential as he is, and that's why he is an immortal name. And Professor Pipsqueak, who's just discovered, you know, the ozone layer, will never be remembered in another 20 years. Michael, I'll give you a follow-up if it's not to argue ecology. Do you get the logic of what I'm saying? As, yeah. Okay. Correct. Okay, great. Paul. Yes, here I am. This is Paul in New York. Okay. Uh, I wanted to go back to uh, where you were talking about how egoism should be contrasted with altruism as a principle and not with the unprincipled version. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if that depends on the prior idea that the question of the beneficiary of one's action is an essential, and if so, how does one arrive at the idea that that's where one should be focusing one's attention? Well, first, how, how do you arrive at the idea that something is what you should be focusing your attention on. In this case, I arrived at it from an adult knowledge that there are really three broad issues that define the cast of an ethical theory. What are you acting for? How do you achieve it? And for whom? For what beneficiary? Now, that is not something I knew until, I mean, as an abstract formulation, until I went into philosophy and realized that in organizing any ethical system, there were these questions that had to be resolved, and that the answer to any one redounded on the others and on the whole system, and that therefore wasn't essential. As a child, or as a beginning inducer, without that information, if I try to project on Rand's development, she would not know that this is a theoretical essential she would know that it's an essential only in this sense. Everything she does depends on its answer. And once she would know that within her context of action, everything that's important to her points to this issue as something she has to have a stand on, her mind would immediately be focused on it. No matter how young she is, as soon as she's got values, if and when someone says to her, give it away, you should be unselfish. If she's a thinking child and, and a genius on top of it, then the first thing she's going to think is, if I should give away my toy, I should give away, you know, uh, my chance to go uh, to, the, to the party, and I should give away you know, the people I like at school, etc., and so on and so on. And that means I should give, I, she would be principal right away, and she would become indignant and uh, obsessed and crucially involved with this issue precisely because she would see that this has tremendous ramifications, which is the definition of essential. On the other hand, uh, if her mother said to her, hey, you got to wash the dishes, uh, after the party on Saturday. She wouldn't now go into the ethics of washing the dishes and the age at which it should start and how long she should spend as against her sisters because even if she didn't want to, her attitude would be, all right, it's, you know, it's a half hour, it doesn't involve anything, and what the hell? So uh, if you're asking as an, as an adult as on the theoretical level, then you can't answer that until you're an adult. That involves the fact that we're reconstructing rather than arriving. If we're asking from the point of view of her arriving at it, precisely because it is an essential, she sees its effect on the concretes that she's surrounded with that matter to her, and therefore it becomes an essential contextually. Does that answer you, Paul? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Nelson. 
Yes, Dr. Peacock, this is Nelson in Pennsylvania. Okay. A friend of mine recently pointed out uh, an article to me that appeared in the Atlantic Monthly by the Harvard biologist E.O. Wilson. The article apparently was from his book on, entitled uh, Consilience, the Unity of Knowledge. And he seems to endorse induction as a means to knowledge and, of course, mentions Francis Bacon in a positive context. Uh, and he also talks about uh, finding cause and effect in all branches of knowledge. How'd you get a job at Harvard? Yeah. That's what, I, that's what amazed me. In fact, uh, I wondered if you had heard of it or if you could comment whether or not that might indicate possibly the beginnings of a new enlightenment period in our, uh, our uh, educational system. I'm sorry, I'm completely ignorant. I don't know the man, I don't know the field of biology. Harry, in the, uh, Binswanger, are you here? Yes, uh, E.O. Wilson is the founder and chief propagandist for sociobiology, which says that man is an ant, so I wouldn't expect much from him. So you don't think it's the beginning of the a new renaissance? Uh, only if he could be somehow terrific in epistemology and awful in his view of the nature of man. Well, um, to me, the decisive thing is he's employed by Harvard. And I long ago made my induction. Uh, I agree, I have to say, I'm sorry to say with William Buckley on that, that I would rather be governed by the first hundred people from any phone book in America than by the uh, faculty at Harvard. So, um, I don't know, does that answer you, Nelson? I'm just, uh, Harry has this answer and I don't know the person. That's helpful because it gives me a, at least a perspective to know where he is coming from because I haven't fully studied the article yet, but I was wondering just whether or not he was on the right track or not. Well, I, I, I can't say more about it than that. Okay, what's your question? Uh, I wanted to ask you a question about the methods which you use to arrive at the course that you are giving. Uh, the, I've taken your previous courses and I noticed a considerable difference in the way you approach the principle from uh, philosophy of objectivism to understanding objectivism to OPAR to OTR now. And uh, OTR is, is finally where I'm beginning to understand a lot more about details of objectivism. So I was wondering if you would tell us how you arrived yourself at the principle. Well, I, I think I said I arrived at the idea of induction being crucial out of despair. If you look at the first uh, brochure that I put out for this course last year, it was basically offered not as a positive means of cognition, but as a method of therapy for rationalists. I had been teaching philosophy for years and had students that were absolutely unbudgeable. And I said uh, at one seminar years ago now, I guess a few years ago now, it's hopeless. You cannot teach these people uh, philosophy because they can't grasp the idea of learning from reality. They can only do it by learning words from other words, and therefore it's hopeless. If you, if you could teach them induction, then it would, there would be a chance. And I, I said, I'm basically retiring. And it was Steve Jolivet in Virginia who was in the seminar, called up, well, why don't you give a course on induction? And I thought, well, I don't have anything to say on induction. You know, that's hopeless. But then gradually we tried seminars on it. And little by little, uh, uh, at first I didn't have any very clear method. Uh, and little by little, uh, it just started to come into focus. But the original inception was despair over teaching rationalists, which 95% of philosophy students, uh, whether they were philosophy majors or not, are. Uh, the broader issue, I would say, is that I could not have discovered uh, this method before I wrote OPAR. And it took me, I met on ran in 51, and it took me essentially 40 years till 91 before I knew enough to be able to write and completely understand OPAR. Uh, it took me that long because I had to myself stop being a rationalist and then I had to integrate and digest all these principles. Only after I had presented the whole thing and I could see the philosophy could I then take each element of it and say 
Now I could try to recreate how would you arrive at this from scratch. It's almost like first you have to have a picture of an entire city from the sky. And then you can say, let's zero in on this skyscraper, which I see is related to all these others, and go all the way back down to how would you build it from scratch. But if all you have is a blurred chaos of some buildings and some piles of bricks and some rubble and etc., you don't know anything. So I think in logic, I first had to grasp the total in a logical, organized way, and that took me a long, long time. And then the idea of taking each element, now that I saw its place in the total, and getting it by itself and reconnecting. And it's like a giant spiral. You know, I'm going back to each of the things that I already wrote a chapter about, but now getting it in a new context of w the essence of which is let's forget all the others and try and get it by itself now, which I couldn't have done before I had a picture of the total. So I don't know if that answers you. Oh, it absolutely does. And oh. I want to say thank you very much for the, making your knowledge available to us. Well, you're more than welcome. I when I, I met Ayn Rand, in, as I say, in the early 50s, and I made it up my mind that I only had one uh, goal in life. I, this was from the very first that I met her was to try to understand what she was saying because I had the experience simultaneously that everything she and I was a teenager then that everything she said was was profound, self-evident, and unintelligible, all at the same time. And the idea was this is the most, like, the crossword puzzle of reality, you know, that you could just easily devote your entire life to trying to untangle. Uh, and I thought I had untangled it all uh, and finished in 91, and then this whole new dimension opened up to me. So I'm still basically trying to figure out but it's a lot easier now, and hopefully it'll get to be that with you. Okay, uh, I think this is a good idea to have a little period like this because there's questions there that I doubt whether you would have uh, written. At least I'm not getting many written questions. And now let's spend the last half an hour on justice, another topic out of ethics. Now, you notice that I didn't say the principle that I want you to validate is that justice is a crucial virtue. Because virtue is a term integrating many different types of proper action. But at the point where we're getting our first concept of justice, it's obviously too early to use such a concept as virtue. Because we don't know any virtues yet. So we simply t say all we want to induce at this early stage is justice is important. Justice is something we should have or should practice. Or. That's all we, we're really trying to get to. Now you might think, I'm sure you wouldn't, but someone might think that the way to validate justice is just to look for examples. You go to court and you see that a murderer gets convicted and an innocent man goes free. But, of course, these are not, they are examples of justice, but they're not perceptual instances. You can perceive the event, but not its justice. So justice takes us farther from the perceptual level than anything we've done so far. See, in the, uh, uh, seeing uh, somebody produce food, we were uh, directly per observing production or even in introspecting the role of abstracting as part of your productive action, you were directly observing your mental process. Or in egoism, you were directly observing your own motivation and priorities. But in justice, there is nothing directly to observe. Uh, now, of course, an adult can tell you, well, the idea is you punish criminals and reward good people, but where did this come from? How do you get it from reality? How do you know what it applies to? What is its scope? Etc. We want to reach an essentialized, stripped-down concept of justice, derived from reality, and we're at the beginning here, so we don't know anything about virtues or life as the standard or epistemology or objectivity. 
all of which presuppose a lot of early knowledge of, on the pattern of justice as an example. So we have to reach this virtue at a point yet at which we don't yet have any theory about how to come to conclusions about anybody's character. But that, it seems paradoxical, but that's actually okay. Because in doing so, we'll make clear to ourselves what we more we need to learn. So we'll learn justice in stages the same way we learn everything. So what do we take as the given? That our disorganized, unsystematic, common sense idea of values, the same things that we took for egoism and with the same understanding. So it would be basically... Whatever gives pleasure or strength or health or money or knowledge or a job, etc., other things being equal is good. Whatever gives pain or weakness or disease, etc., etc., is bad. And this is, in fact, how people make judgments in terms of such values as they do hold. And only later, if they're sophisticated and philosophical, can they get to the idea of what integrates and validates all of these values. So... We've got the same basic type of starting point as um, uh, we had in regard to... Now let's start then with the reduction of justice. And I got myself a definition from the dictionary. Administering a deserved punishment or reward... I looked up deserve because I thought that's pretty uh, crucial here. And it said to merit or be worthy of because of one's acts. So administering a deserved punishment or reward. Now it seemed obvious to me that the first thing in our reduction that is going down step by step. The first step back down would be we couldn't reach the idea of a deserved punishment or reward if we didn't know what we meant by deserve, right? So we have to know justice obviously involves something deserved. And if we didn't have the idea of deserved, we couldn't reach justice. Obviously, this is going to involve, just, just by common sense looking ahead, do we ever give punishment or reward without saying, you deserve this, you're worthy of this because of your acts? Obviously, yes. We punish animals, for instance, or reward them. But we don't say they deserve it. Not in the sense of they merit or are worthy of it because of their acts. So deserve is something added to punishment or reward. And we couldn't have a concept of justice if we didn't have this concept of deserving. Now, what do we need to reach such a concept as deserving? Well, something that's before that. Before you can say, is a punishment uh, deserved or not? Or is a reward deserved or not? What concepts would you have to have? Reward and punishment. And once you have reward and punishment, then you can distinguish deserved rewards and punishments versus other kinds. So earlier even than deserve is reward and punishment. And that then that it raises the question... Well, wh- where would we get these concepts? Why do we need them? Why do they come up? Are they justified? That involves that we have to act a certain way, right? We have to give rewards and punishments. And then when we decide that we, why we have to give rewards and punishments, we're going to say, and in some cases this is deserved, and in other cases not that it's undeserved, but it's awarded on some other principle. So, uh, our second step down is validating the notion or the idea of the importance of reward and punishment in action. Now, what does that presuppose? To reward or punish, whether a person or an animal, 
presupposes what? Well, look at it this way. Punishment means a negative conferred because of a bad or undesired, improper, whatever action. And a reward is a positive conferred because of some desirable, proper, good action. So before you could reach such an idea as a punishment or a reward, you'd have to first do what? You'd have to reach the idea that some actions and some people are good and some are bad, which means we have to reach the idea of evaluating men and their actions. Why is that important? So if first we'd have to reach the idea of evaluating men and their actions, and then a certain kind of action on the basis of our evaluation, which would be punishment or reward, and then something else, X, I don't know, which will help us to discover the difference between punishment and reward in the case of men and in the case of animals, is this whatever leads us to say it's deserved in the one case? Now, I don't mean that if you, if you uh, punish your dog by making him sit in the corner or whatever, uh, it's undeserved or unjust. I mean, you can't say it's deserved in the sense that it's deserved for a human being. But why, I'm not going to say. We're going to learn that at the end. So the question becomes then, what do you have to do to discover the importance of evaluating human beings? Uh, how would you reach the conclusion, and this is the end of our chain back, the fourth, and therefore the first turning around, what would enable someone to reach the conclusion that it's important to judge or evaluate the behavior of people? What would a person have to know or discover to come to the conclusion that evaluation of others as good or bad is important? Now we're working our way backward here. Is it possible that starting from scratch with no idea of judging or evaluating at all, just passively reacting without assessment to whatever happens in the inanimate world, a person one day jumps up and says, but it's important to judge human beings. Now that, I think, is inconceivable. Further, a person that judged nothing would be unable to function or choose at all in any field because he'd be devoid of value judgment. So, as I see it, therefore, the first thing you'd have to learn in order later to learn the importance of judging people is why should you judge anything at all as good or bad? Whether it's animate, inanimate, low or high. And there we reach something which everyone in some form knows from direct experience. And a first level simple induction from perceptual observation is possible. So this is the structure of the induction as we work it out by reduction. Our first stage will be what will we have to observe to come to the conclusion that it's important to judge the things around us. That they have consequences that are good or bad for us and therefore we need to judge and act accordingly. That'll be the first observation, that things have consequences. And then we're going to have to observe, gee, human beings are just like this. They have consequences, and therefore we have to judge them. And then the third will be, but once we judge them, some kind of action is, is going to be crucial just as it is in the case of things, and that's what's going to bring in reward and punishment. And then fourth, we're going to have to observe something about 
man or the situation which brings in the idea of a deserved uh, behavior. Now, that is the, the uh, structure that I uh, lay out for inducing justice. And here, I'm going to use the genus method several times, and I think you can start with it right here as a kind of a sweep. The genus w that I would pick right here would be for a conscious being to achieve value, it must evaluate and act accordingly. See, a plant doesn't have to evaluate, or rather, it's, the values are built into its behavior. But evaluating in the sense of, in some form, pronouncing good is essential to any conscious living being. If it's to gain any value, it has to, in some way, evaluate and correspondingly act. And then I would divide that broad genus up into the non-volitional, the animals, whose evaluation is, is in perceptual form, in terms of pleasure and pain, and then who they act accordingly. And on the other hand, the conceptual species, man. Now then, conceptual evaluation and action would be subdivided into two categories. It's application to the non-human, that is your evaluation of the non-human, versus your evaluation of men, your evaluation and action in regard to men, including yourself under human. Now the non-human side involves evaluating and then Encouraging or discouraging, encouraging what's good and discouraging or avoiding what's bad with no implication of it desert or deserving. Like uh, if there's a storm, you say that's bad and you got out of its way, but you don't say that a wicked storm deserves 30 years in jail. There's no question of deserving. In judging, however, human beings, the appropriate action for a reason yet to be discovered is what we call deserved, not simply awarded. Okay, so if you're with me, that's what we are going to start with. Evaluation in regard to the, the non-human, uh, uh, the ordinary things, is the first thing you'd have to discover. The need to evaluate, uh, the need of value judgment, put it that way. And I go back to food, shelter, and clothing as the obvious places to start. You can't get anywhere in cognition unless you start with things like tomatoes taste good, promote your health and strength. On the other hand, not if they're moldy, that's bad. Or if they're poison. Um, the milk is good, makes you strong, but if it's tainted, makes you sick, that's bad. You should avoid it. Or switch to clothing. In a blizzard, a parka, a scarf, and gloves are good. They're essential to keep yourself alive, whereas a bikini is a disaster. It's bad. Uh, or Wearing sneakers and jeans for a corporate interview is bad. It's job-threatening in most cases. Or, changing another example, in regard to recreation, swimming is good, it's fun, in a clear, calm lake. But if it's uh, turbulent and filled with sharks, it's definitely bad and you shouldn't do it. Now these, no one can function or reach any cognitive development who doesn't have a zillion of these type of knowledge. And this is the first thing, kind of thing, that kids learn as an essential of survival. The pattern, I think, is obvious. 
And after enough of it, depending upon how bright you are, you end up with an inductive principle. And that is, putting it in its simplest terms, things are not neutral. They have good or bad consequences. Good food, the right clothes, the proper recreational facility, etc. Foster your various values. And bad, wrong, etc. Do the opposite. Now the observation here is on the perceptual level. So the first inductive conclusion then, a practical conclusion from our induction is it's important to judge things when choosing among them. Precisely because they have consequences, good or bad. They're not neutral. So when you pick one thing versus another, you have to know, is it a good or a bad thing? That's as a simple generalization. And judging things here simply means identifying what they are enough to know what you need to to deal with them successfully, to be able to evaluate their future behavior or results. And uh, since you constantly pick things and experience the consequences, you have ample basis to induce that if you're going to maximize the chance of achieving your values, in fact, if you're going to achieve your values at all, you must evaluate the things. Now, we're not talking about people, the things you're dealing with. Now, is it enough to just evaluate these things and say, well, this tomato is poison? Okay, it's really bad, and now let's swallow it down. Obviously not. Inherent in the evaluation is that a corresponding action is necessary. An action, in the case of bad, the things you evaluate as bad, of avoiding them, minimizing them, insulating yourself from them. And if the things are good, embrace them, encourage them, etc. Now this framework, everybody that's alive and functional at all knows. We all become accustomed to evaluating before we act and as a guide to action. And of course, if you act impulsively, one such action can be the end. Once you are accustomed to this induction, you're ready to go to the next point, which is now two, then the next stage of cognition. And that consists of grasping that men are just like things in this, in this regard. Now, of course, men are different from things. But the difference will come in later. The first thing any, any child or inducer would notice is that everywhere he looks, there are people that he thinks in some form as good and that good consequences come to him from these people versus people that he thinks of as bad and harm that comes to him as a result. Now you have to remember our point that in inducing moral examples, we have to take for granted a certain common sense morality. If the inducer is stuffed full at this point of the wrong concept of good, you know, if he's a thorough Kantian and he's taught that, then he'll come to the conclusion that the good is harmful to him. And the bad is the practical and essential. If so, he will never get to any such concept as justice. Or he'll consider justice positively life-threatening. But we're neglecting that much of a perversion and following the path of Western civilization, which, whatever its problems never got to the point, thanks to the Greeks of thinking, that the good was harmful. So, just on a common sense level, the observer, the inducer would observe, say, a reasonable school teacher or parent as against a whimsical tyrant. And the one he thinks of as dealable with, good, 
understandable, and it's the result, what he gets from this, is good things. Knowledge, safety, you fill it in. Whereas the other is undealable with, unpredictable, bad, uh, and he gets hurt in various ways as a result. Now, you notice we need a contrast, as you always do in induction. Good people lead to good results. Bad people lead to bad results. Or he can just observe the difference a child between a nice kid his own age and a bully. And let's say one tells the truth, uh, he's imaginative about games, he's fun to be with, and the other is cruel and sullen and is a threat, a source of fear and possible pain. And you very quickly grasp, even as a child, uh, strictly on the grounds of what's going to come from dealing with these people. The importance of judging, of evaluating before you make choices or take actions in the human realm. Now, after he's looked at his own immediate circle, he has to look more broadly and ultimately discover that there are people who work and think, like doctors, for instance, who acquire skills and thereby can achieve treatments that benefit him and all their customers, as against con artists, uh, in the field who lie and make false promises and in effect rob people and subject them to danger, etc. The range of examples is, is tremendous uh, and the ability to identify the results obviously depends on the knowledge of the particular inducer. But the point is that using only common sense, virtues and vices and observing human behavior in the context of your earlier judgment, knowledge that judgment of things is a necessity of preceding action, judgment here meaning evaluation, is a necessity of action, enables you very easily to come to the inductive conclusion that human beings are not neutral either, that they have consequences too on your values, on you, according to whether they're good or bad. Good men lead to good consequences. Bad men lead to bad. Just like good things and bad things. So men are like tomatoes in this respect. And therefore in making choices about in regard to people, whether it's friends or associates or whatever, insofar as it's up to you, you have to decide whether or how to become involved with them. It's important to judge them, to identify their nature or actions as good or bad, and thereby figure out the probable future results on you. In other words, you reach by induction the conclusion, the importance of judging a person prior to dealing with them. Now, the important point here is that if you regard other men the way you do stars in the sky, as entities completely self-contained without effect on you, then it would be pointless to judge them. Judging is not a categorical imperative. You don't judge simply because morality exists and you must apply it. Why? If you're going to learn from reality, you have to learn by observation, and the only reason why it's important to judge them is because you discover case by case that there's a connection between what a man is value-wise and how he's going to affect you and your values. It's exactly the same method as why you have to judge potential food and clothes, etc. Now, there's an awful lot of things that are involved in judging a man that we don't know anything about at this point, even though in the philosophic presentation of justice, it would be absolutely essential. For instance, when Ayn Rand discusses justice as a philosopher, she identifies it as a subcategory of objective judgment, 
a, uh, involving judgment by an objective moral standard. Now, the inducer we're talking about has no clue of any of this at this point. Objectivity is a more advanced, later concept, which you could not possibly put in at this stage of the person's cognitive development, even though it's absolutely essential to the philosophic definition. Just as I wouldn't dream of putting the faculty of measurement omission into reason in our second class, even though it's philosophically essential to the concept of reason. What is the real content of this person's discovery at this early stage when we say you must judge others? He doesn't know about objectivity. The most that he could be expected to know is, i got to judge them as best as I can and find out what they really are. That's inherent in, in judging it all. It all hinges on getting correct what's good and what's bad. If you wish that the poison tomato was really good and then you eat it after giving a pretend evaluation, any child knows it's still going to poison you. And the same is true for human beings. Judging honestly, trying to get the truth is against pretense of any kind. That is the most that the person gets at this stage. He doesn't know anything about objective moral judgment, but that's his first glimmer of being objective. Being honest in regard to the facts open to him. So... Let me conclude by giving you, by laying out for you, and then we'll go into it further. What does he really know at this point? And we'll do it by the genus method again. And that'll lay out what's the contrast. Judging others is important as against what? And here, because you need that as a contrast to know exactly what you know. And here, I think the genus method is the best way of laying out what the alternatives are to the policy of judging us. So the genus I would write down is, man needs a policy of dealing with others. And then I, div I subdivided three ways, not two, ha ha. Now, there's some logical rule that this is impossible, but even so, I'm doing it. Because you'll see that one is really a subdivision of the other, but it's more helpful to do it as a tripartite subdivision. Under that, one wing is evaluating them. That's where we are. A second wing would be refusal to evaluate, agnosticism. Judge not that ye be not judged. Who are you to cast the first stone, etc.? And then a third wing would be anti-evaluation. That is the nihilist, the egalitarian, or the evaluate in reverse. Extol the evil and crush the good. So I divide it into evaluate, don't evaluate, and evaluate in reverse. And it would be like the difference if nutrition was our policy. Evaluation would be like taking in food. Non-evaluation would be like starving. And the nihilist variant would be like swallowing poison. So they're not identical, but they're two things, both of which contrast with eating. So the child at this stage is committed to the importance of honest evaluation. Now, if you want, you can subdivide, evaluate into honest and reasonable versus pretend and unreasonable. And that would be equivalent in the food to going by dietary laws or fads or uh, becoming a nature organic food freak or whatever as against choosing your food reasonably. But the main thing that we're discovering right now is that you need to evaluate and then contrast that as against agnosticism or the deliberate reversal of uh, evaluation. Now, I'm afraid we really have run out of time, uh, and I don't think this is going to take the whole hour next time, so let me, in conclusion, simply tell you that the next topic is going to be objectivity.
is, an, is essential to knowledge. It's important to knowledge. Now, you can take for granted the idea of knowledge in common sense terms and focus on the minimum steps necessary to reach the early idea of objectivity. And I'm even going to help you here because this is your first foray into epistemology. I'm going to give you Aristotle's e effective definition of objectivity, which you can work with. A volitional adherence to reality in cognition via the use of logic. Volitional or deliberate adherence to reality in a process of cognition via the use of logic. Now you see what kinds of observations and inductions and what stage would enable you to come to the idea of a volitional adherence to reality when you're trying to learn something by the use of logic. It is mammoth. It makes justice seem like a joke. And I'm going to take you through what Aristotle actually had to do step by step and see what you can figure out and we'll, we'll finish justice, which we're just about not even halfway through next time. And then we will go to objectivity. I'm sorry, we're two minutes late. So I will quickly say farewell to each and everyone.